welcome to the USU Career Studio podcast that helps you navigate your career path. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to tell your friends and family all about it. Subscribe to our podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you listen to get access to our newest content. Thanks for joining us for our Friday face-to-face episode. I'm Marissa Armistead, your host, and I am so excited to have our very own John Folger on the show with us today. Welcome, John. Thank you. It's nice to be here. John is a USU Aggie through and through, earning both his Bachelor of Science in Psychology with a minor in Chemistry and Master of Education in School Counseling, also from Utah State. John has experience in academic mentoring, school counseling, career coaching as a graduate peer advisor for our office, and teaching as both a TA and instructor. You may also recognize him as the wonderful host of our Tuesday Tip episodes. We are so sad to see John leave USU uh, Career Services as he moves past graduation, but we are so, so excited for him. So with that, John, I have to bring up a fun fact, of course, which is that you are a self-proclaimed nerd. So you deeply enjoy the Lord of the Rings series and you made a point of letting me know that you've actually read each book at least 12 times, which I think is uh, a little bit crazy and awesome. And you're also an avid D&D player. So talk to us about your self-proclaimed nerdiness. So, yeah, like you said, I uh, growing up, I, I read Lord of the Rings. I started very early. I remember I was actually homeschooled in the fourth grade. And after, I think it was my seventh or eighth time by fourth grade of reading The Hobbit, I was like, I should keep track of this. And then I never did. And so <laughs> The Hobbit and the original three books I've read, like I said, at least a dozen times. Some of the other extra uh, history books that come with Lord of the Rings, I've read at least two or three times. I have a giant Lord of the Rings poster yes. in my room. And then with the D&D, it is a, a new passion that I have. I, like I said, I am a nerd. And and Dungeons and Dragons, for those of you who are listening who may not know, it's, it's a role-playing game where you, it's all made up, it's all in your head, it's adult play pretend. And that was a little, that was always the line that I drew. I was like, I can do a lot of things, but I'm, I'm not going to get into that. And then my wife's cousin, about a, a little bit over a year ago, um, texted us and was like, hey, I want to, the person who creates the story is called the dungeon master, or the game master. So he's like, I want to, I want to lead this game. Would you guys be interested in joining? And I was like, I mean, I guess whatever. And so my wife and I started playing and it has become a true like obsession. And now we are in that original one. We're in another one. I'm starting where I'm going to be the game master um, in a couple of weeks. So we, we're going to have three different games. And it's something that I just love the aspect of being able to create a world in your head. It's all on like graph paper and just sheets of paper. And it's, it's all pretend. And it's just, I could go on for <laughs> hours talking about my love of D&D and all the intricacies of of getting to know yourself. Um, I've learned a lot about myself through my nerdyism of, of who, what type of person I want to be. Huh. Um, these imaginary characters that I create on my head. Like what is the ideal version of me and how I can become that ideal version of myself in real life? Through, so through interesting. So yeah. interesting, John. I have to say a lot of um, the things you've mentioned are a little out of my wheelhouse. However, I, I would say there are probably other things that I'm a total nerd in, but uh, that's so interesting. It's so interesting to learn that about you. And I feel like I am now um, inclined to go watch the Lord of the Rings movies, at least. I haven't ever yeah. done that. So shame on me. I'll, I'll get on that. <laughs> Top notch. Always recommend. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, as we're looking to um, this month of May, everybody, if their seniors are graduating, um, lots of emotions are, are going through the head about, about now. But I would love to start our conversation about reflection today, actually going back and looking at some of your earliest memories. So thinking back to like, I don't know, five-year-old John, what do you remember wanting to be when you grew up? So back when I was like my earliest memory of what I want to be when I grew up, grow up, I always said I wanted to be a scientist. And then people started questioning like, okay, scientist is a very broad term. What do you want to do with science? And I wanted to create, again, going back to my nerdiness, I wanted to create dragons. And so I got really growing up through elementary school. Um, I got really into like genetic engineering and I was like, I'm going to be a genetic engineer. And then as I grew up a little bit more, got into like junior high, high school, I learned that genetic engineering is super like math and like analytic thinking heavy, which I am not super great at that. And then for a short time, I was like, I want to be a fighter pilot in the Air Force. Some 
things happen there where I didn't get accepted into the Air Force Academy and I took that as a sign, don't do that. And so I was really lost. Just reflecting back, I was really lost on what I wanted to do when I was graduating high school. I didn't have a career path at all. I couldn't answer the question of what do you want to do when you grow up because everything I'd wanted to do was no longer applicable. And I had a high school class. Uh, it was a psychology high school class and I absolutely loved it. And I loved the idea of getting into people's heads and helping them figure out their problems. And so I as you said, I went on and got my bachelor's in psychology and, and some things happened, which we'll probably talk about in a little bit, but, and that didn't work out the way I, I thought it was going to work out. And I've since found my way into higher education with academic and career advising. And I am absolutely loving that. It's it so is interesting. a passion that I never knew I needed. I love that. Okay. So as I'm like kind of making this transition from, okay, so high school, and then you kind of move into college, what was your first, we'll call it like your first real big kid job that you actually got paid for? What was the first job you ever had and what did it consist of? So the, actually the first job that I actually, I, I got paid for was my family owns a skating rink. It's been in the family for about three generations now. So I started working at a roller skating rink when I was about seven or eight years old. And originally I wasn't paid formally. Um, my grandpa would come in. I only worked like once or twice a week when I was like eight years old because child labor laws and such. <laughs> my grandpa would come in and he would hand me a $5 bill and that's how I got paid. And then I went on to negotiate with my parents that, hey, I'm sweeping floors. I'm helping customers at nine years old. I deserve to get paid. Oh my so gosh. they bumped me up from not getting paid to $3 an hour. And then I got bumped up to $5 an hour and then minimum wage and, and up and up and up. So my first job was at the family roller skating rink. And I started that when I was eight and I worked it all through high school. We didn't, in my family, we didn't get paid for like chores or we didn't get an allowance. We worked at the family skating rink. And so all of my money and I had to budget my money and it, it, it really helped me grow up and learn financial sense. Because if I wanted to buy that new X box. That was $300. I had to have that conversation of this is 10 shifts of work. This is 10 Saturdays. Is this worth 10 Saturdays to you? And I had to make those decisions. And, and it really working at the skating rink changed how I how I viewed the world of work. I became a self starter. I'm much more like I said, I'm much more attentive to what I spend because I'm I, I grew up with that awareness. I also learned how to interact with people. It was a customer service job. So I had to keep the customer happy while still maintaining the rules of, of my parents that I couldn't give away free stuff no matter how much I got yelled at. I got yelled at a lot. And so I learned the conflict de-escalation at the roller skating rink um, on typically on Friday and Saturday nights. That was the night where a lot of kids from lower socioeconomic areas of Pocatello, we were a babysitter for later elementary, junior high and, and high school years where these parents who wanted to go out to the bars and drink and everything, they would drop off their kids as young as five, six, seven years old. And for five dollars, we would watch them because we were open from either depending on the, the hours at least from 7 until 11 p.m. These were some kids who came from some very hard backgrounds. And so that has helped me in my future careers is I, I learned that not everyone has the same privileges that I do and that the background of an individual really does affect their behavior. And just because somebody is acting out in a certain way doesn't mean that they're a bad person, but that their whole life, their, like I said, their socioeconomic circumstances really influence who they are as a person and that it was my job to treat everyone with respect because I, I had to. It was part of the customer service personality. And I really got to know a lot of these kids that they're not bad kids. They're fantastic kids who are so kind but just haven't been given all of the privileges and opportunities that they need to fully successfully grow. And so having that job growing up, that first paying job where I was, I was getting paid like a normal employee and sometimes less than the other normal employees. Being part of the family business didn't grant me all of the privileges that some people may think. I learned a lot that has and does inform how I go in my future career path of working with college students of that understanding people's backgrounds and treating them as they come. That not everyone comes from the same backgrounds and, and really also conflict de-escalation that sometimes you have these kids who are straight up violent. <laughs> And so you have to figure out what am I going to do with a violent 16 year old and how am I going to 
diffuse the situation in a way that is best for everyone, which is something that I, I do not quite as intensely. But when you're talking to a student with career services, when you're talking to a student, you have to make them comfortable. You have to de-escalate their stress level so they are more successful. I Clearly, I do not lack speaking. Um, but that was my first job was was working at the roller skating rink. And I did that f- between the ages of eight to about 19 or 20. That's awesome. And I, I, it sounds like you learned some really valuable skills that you have been able to use throughout your career thus far. So that's really cool, John. Yeah. So as we're kind of transitioning now into that college phase, I'd love to hear about what your path looked like for finding majors, because I know there is so much stress over declaring a major um, and then, you know, do I consider a master's degree or a PhD after that? So talk to us a little bit about your major journey in college and how you figured out what a good fit looked like for you. So as I said, I had taken a, a high school class for psychology and that's something on the Tuesday tip guy. So to give a tip to anyone who's listening is find out as early as you can explore and that, that'll help you inform. So I, I came into USU knowing that I kind of wanted to do something with people and I, I took some intro to um, psych courses and, and really enjoyed those. I enjoy psychology. Not every class is the best. I didn't love all of my psychology courses. Some of them I really, really struggled through and I was like, am I choosing the right major? And then I kind of learned, okay, this isn't the entire major. So I chose a major based on my interests of, I like working with people. I like helping them deal with their problems. It's something that I enjoy is is kind of those hard conversations when people would come to me. And I was that person in college and in high school and, and throughout my life. For whatever reason, people really opened up to me. One of those natural consequences. And so I, I figured if people are already opening up to me naturally, why not make a career out of that? So that's how I chose my um, major. My minor Um, is actually an an interesting story because I just enjoyed chemistry. Chemistry is one of those things that I always enjoyed. So I kept for just my general education classes, I just kind of kept taking chemistry courses that would kind of double dip. And I like chemistry and it takes a general education requirement. So when I was declaring a major, like I said, I I chose psychology because it was something that I was passionate about. It was something that I wanted to research further. And that's why I chose it. They told me I needed to choose a minor. And so I went and they looked at my transcript and they said, Said, hey, you have a lot of chemistry courses. And I said, I sure do. I've taken a lot. <laughs> so I go over to the, the chemistry department and I say, okay, I'm kind of interested in a minor. What would that take? And they said, you are one class away from a minor and you are about three classes away from graduating with, you could double major in chemistry. So I was like, oh, so that is how I came into a chemistry minor was I just randomly took classes and it worked out that I'd taken enough to have that minor. So that's how I chose my major was just something I was interested in. As far as getting into a, ma- uh, a, a graduate program, a master's degree, I was not planning on doing a mass, uh, getting graduate work at all. Even though I'm going into higher education, um, academic advising, and this is part of why I'm doing academic advising, I really don't like school. It's stressful to me. I really just don't enjoy the whole school process. So I didn't want to do extra school. And I didn't know I was going to go on to graduate school until my senior year, where I sat down with my academic advisor in my senior, my last year. And the question was brought up, okay, you're, you're getting your bachelor's. That doesn't really get you a lot of jobs. Where are you going to graduate school? And I said, what? Like, what, what do you mean? Like... You get a college degree and you're done. Like master's is for those like specialty, like the engineers and the doctors, they go to graduate school, not not the average person for work. And I I was completely blindsided of, I need to go to graduate school. So I had no idea. And during this time, my original plan was to do a more clinical therapy of helping people with that. And I had a, a few personal life experiences that kind of showed me that that would not be good for my own personal mental health. I am not great at compartmentalizing, which is something you really need to do for clinical psychology, or else you would take home all of the bad truly terrible stuff you hear home with you every day. And I was like, I I can't handle that. So what do I do? And so I graduated and I tell this story because I feel like this is going to be something that a lot of our listeners are going to experience. I graduated with a degree in psychology and no idea where I was going. 
None, no clue. I graduated and everyone was asking me, what are you going to do? And I kept giving them half answers and, oh, I'm going to go to graduate school because I had just learned three months ago that that's what I had to do. Um, I hadn't planned on it. And so I took a year off to try to figure out what I wanted to do. And through the process of looking for work and, and kind of doing my own, knowing I wanted to still do something in psychology, helping people, um, I came to, I want to work with students. I don't like school. Um, I had some experiences in school. So I want to make it so no, no person has to go through what I did. Nobody should hate school like I did and, and how to help them through that. And so I applied to a school psychology program here at Utah State. Um, I got to an interview process and I didn't get accepted. And that was my plan. I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And I didn't get accepted. And that sucked. I hated it because I was like, okay, what do I do now? I, st- I know I want to work with students. I know kind of what I want to do, but how, what do I do? And so finally I, I went up to the campus again and I talked to the psychology academic advisors and I said, I, I kind of want to do what you do. How do I, how do I help? I want to s- get students through college fast because I did it very quickly. I graduated in six semesters. So three years, I, I graduated the year early um, due to AP credits and just working my bum off and my academic advisors. They taught me every hoop I needed to jump through to get it done quick. I said, I want to do that. I want to help students prepare for their life. I want to get them through um, college as quickly as possible and not calling out these academic advisors because this was on me. I wanted to change my experience with them so that no student would be blindsided like I was of, okay, this is the career path for what the major you're choosing. Good, bad. We're not here to argue that this is the reality of your major. And so through talking to them, I kind of learned that, hey, I want to do this academic advising or career advising gig. How do I do that? Which led me to um, the graduate program of school counseling. It was recommended to me by the other academic advisors. I talked to about four or five academic advisors and was like, hey, I know I need some sort of master's degree. What's a good one? They recommended this program. And here we are. So that's a really long explanation for your question. No, that's great. I love that. And I love, I love that you were able to learn as you went, I think sometimes we want to plan every step, but when doors get closed and it's out of our control, then we have to learn how to adapt. And so I love that you were able to kind of walk us through the awesome parts, but also the challenging parts of getting to where you're at. So I think that's really inspiring and and really cool, a really cool story. John, I would love to hear a little bit about um, some favorite USU memories as we are talking about reflection. I'd love to have you think back on some of your favorites. One of my favorites is definitely... Aggie basketball. I grew up in a basketball family. I don't play myself, but I, I just remember when I when I first came here in 2012. It was, yeah, it was 2012. My first basketball game, and back then, and, and even now, the herd was just it was deafeningly loud. Just how loud it is in the spectrum. I was I was there my first year. They were doing a a study on how loud it is in this confined space. So this guy was walking next to me with a decibel recorder. And at one, after somebody had made a dunk or something, I leaned over to the guy and I was like, how loud is it? And he's like, it is 110 decibels in here right now. Like he showed me the meter and I was like, this is, this is insane. And just, that's one of my, my favorite um, memories is that. I love it. I love it. Another question that I have for you is, you know, if you were to think back to like 18 year old John, was college what you had originally expected or anticipated? Yes and no. I knew it was going to be a little bit more freedom, I'll call it, where I, I knew I was going to be able to pick my classes. And and I didn't really have that supervision of somebody waking me up and making sure I went to class. I have the personality that I, I'm very neurotic and anxious. And so I always went to my classes. So it didn't really <laughs> matter if somebody was watching me or not. But so, yes, it was it was I was expecting the freedom, but I was not expecting the fun. In high school and in junior high, we all hear those stories. Well, well, this won't fly in college. Once you get to college, it's not going to be like this. And then you'd like walk into your class and half the time your professor wouldn't show up. I had a professor who would come into class on his like longboard. He was an English <laughs> professor and he would just like roll up to class on his longboard and be like, you know what? I know I told you guys to read this assignment, but I read all of the assignments too. He did the assignments with us and he's like, it's a terrible assignment. I hated it. I, why would, if I don't like it, why would I make you do it? And he cut out like 
three assignments out of the out of the syllabus just willy-nilly and i was like this is awesome <laughs> and so it was in ways yes it was what i was expecting and in other ways just it's a lot more fun than i was expecting and if i could be an eternal college student with only taking like one or two classes that i actually want to take i would i would do it if it didn't cost thousands of dollars i would live the college life for the rest of my life because it's the best love it love it love it next question that i have for you john is about the cheerleaders that you've had throughout your college experience so i'd love for you to share maybe what are two people who really helped you get the most out of the experience and and just survive <laughs> have to give a shout out to my family i would call my parents all the time and and be stressing and they're like you know what it's okay. It's it's all right. Like you'll you'll survive and and you'll be okay. I lived with the same guy for how long have I been in Logan? Like 10 years? No. 7 9 years. For the 9 years I've lived in Logan, about 4 of those 9 years I lived with the same person. And so he his name is Alaric. He was one of my best cheerleaders cuz he would he grew we grew to know each other on a very uh deep level and so there were times when he knew i needed to focus and he was also there to be that stress relief hey we got to take a break and i'd be like no like i gotta study like i gotta do this we gotta do this and he's like no no you don't you can take a 10 minute break to go down to the gas station we'll get sodas we'll walk back it's like a half an hour break you need a half an hour break and he really I would not have survived because I would have just studied myself into the ground and I would not have gotten out and, and different friends. Having friends is is super important. I'm an introvert, that nerdy introverted. I do the stereotype where I, I like being a homebody. I don't go out. I don't, I'm not into all the parties. I'm not into going out, but I had some awesome people who said, you need this. And I had those cheerleaders. And the last cheerleader that got me through graduate school so many times is my wife because the the school counseling program is a great program. I am not bashing on the school counseling program. I loved it. It's great. But it is meant for K through 12. And I am focusing on college, the university level. So a lot of the concepts were not applicable to me. And so I struggled with that. I struggled with, I hate to be the person for anyone who's listening and thinking of going into higher education, uh, working for it. It's not a moneymaker. It, it doesn't have a lot of funds, to be honest. And so I'd be sitting there. Um, I I had to drive to Kaysville and I'd be sitting there from about 3.30 p.m. to after 10 p.m. in Kaysville. Then I would have to drive the hour back to Logan. And I would sit there every Thursday at about 6.30, 7 o'clock and just think, what in the crap am I doing? Why am I doing this? I'm not super enjoying this class because it doesn't feel applicable to me. Again, school counseling program is great. Highly recommend it for everyone. Great, fantastic program. But for me, it wasn't an exact fit like I wanted it to be. And I knew I wasn't going into a super high paying profession. And so I'd be sitting there thinking, what am I going to do? I'd get home super almost depressed of like, why am I doing this? And my wife would pump me up. And by the next morning, I would be fine. And I got through my, I could not have gotten through my master's program without my wife. And so my advice to anyone listening is find somebody who is that roommate who will say, okay, you need to take a break. Or who is my wife who is saying, no, no, you got to do this. This is going to be better. Look at the horizon. On the horizon, this is coming and you will be able to do it. And because of that, that cheerleading that I got, I made it through a, a hard for me um, graduate program. And I am getting into, I'm moving on to a, a California school that I am very excited to work at. And I could not have done that without the cheerleaders I have. Love it, so. John. Sounds like you had a lot of good cheerleaders, which is so oh. helpful as you, as you try and make these really important life decisions. So I yeah. love that you brought all of that into it. So I'd love to hear a little bit as you are graduating um, quite soon, I'd love to hear a little bit about what your next steps after graduation might look like. So, oh, like I said, I am going to be working at a California school. I'm going to be working at USC um, and working as an academic um, retention and review counselor. So what that means is I'm going to be helping students register for their classes and make sure that they are taking the classes that are appropriate to them. So I'm going to be doing what I set out to do when little senior John was figuring out what he wanted to do. This was this is what I'm going to do. And how I got here is some really great luck and perseverance. In looking back and reflecting and the advice that I would give to people who are in the circumstance that I was in when I graduated as a graduated with my bachelor's where you don't know where it's where you're heading or 3 months ago where I was where I knew I knew I needed to move out to California. 
because that's where my wife wants to work. She's finding work out there. So that's where I needed to find it. And it was up to me. But I had sent out close to 25 to 30 applications to different universities. I'm talking community colleges, private universities, public universities, universities that weren't even close to where we wanted to live. Like it was going to be a two, two and a half hour commute without traffic that I was looking at. And I had no idea. But what I did is I persevered. And what I mean by that is I kept sending out those applications. I applied to graduate school to get me where I wanted to be. Even if I didn't know the path that I wanted to to go on, I still walked on the path that I thought was correct. And that's a tip that I would give is a lot of people um, with my career advising. I hear students say this a lot of, well, I don't know if I want to do this major, or I don't know if I want to pursue this career path because I don't know if it's the right path and I don't want to get down that path and have it be a mistake. And so they end up doing nothing. And that is the mistake. Uh, My mantra that I tell students all the time is the only way to go down the wrong path is to not move because any path you, if you're moving, you are doing the right direction. You are going in the right direction because even if you get down the path, even if you graduate to be a senior and you realize that what you majored in or what you thought you wanted to do is no longer applicable, there are things that you have learned, the experiences you have gained along this path that will help you in, in whatever field you go into. If I wasn't going into a psychological field, my studies in psychology would help me in a business field because in business, you have to know how people think or else you're not going to sell anything. In the sciences, you have to know how you're still going to be working in a lab with other people. My degrees helped me in whatever path I was going to choose. So that's my advice, is the only way to go down the wrong path is to not move at all. I think that's great. And I love, I just love this idea of continuing action. And like you say, you can redirect and re, you know, reframe as you go, but you have to take those steps in order to figure out if it is right or wrong. And, and so I really do appreciate that advice, John. I think that's, that's great as people are moving throughout their degree, but also just throughout their career. I think that's so, such good advice. Um, as we come to our, our close of the day here, um, I would love to ask you one final question. And that question is, how has reflection helped you learn from past experiences and also grow? So reflection is the critical part of, of how I've gotten to where I am, because like, like we've been talking about this entire time, um, I am still using lessons and, and experiences from when I was an eight-year-old kid sweeping floors at a roller skating rink, that work ethic. And I would not be able to process that into my current life without the action of reflection, with, without taking time at certain parts of my life of, of sitting down and, and actively looking back, okay, what did I learn in each of these circumstances that I can apply to my future problems? So reflection is critical. If you're not reflecting, you're not going to be the best person that you can be because those experiences, the good, bad, neutral experiences that you've had, academic, not academic, career, all of your life experiences can be applied in so many ways. And you won't even know what you've had, what experiences you've had if you don't reflect, if you don't take the time to to sit down and, and look back at, okay, this is what I've done. And this is how I can apply it into different circumstances. Because I guarantee you can, whoever's listening, you can take experiences that you've had in the past that may not even apply to where you want to go. Initially, if you look back and reflect on them and and really look for how you can apply them. And so that's how I've used reflection is is by taking the time in my own life and, and going back and doing that. Yeah, I think that's I think that's great, John. And I especially love this idea of um, being able to learn principles, but then also apply them later on in life. You've kind of mentioned that several times that there are past experiences where you learned a lesson and then you took it to a new situation and said, I can apply the same principles here. It might be a little bit different circumstance, but I can still apply those same principles that I learned. So I think that's really valuable. John, uh, 
I want to say a huge thank you on a couple of different levels. One for being here with us today, but also for hopping onto this project. As a lot of people probably know, you're the Tuesday tip guy. And we, <laughs> like I said, I have such mixed feelings because I'm so excited to see you move on and, and do great things. But you've been such a joy to work with on this project. And so my heart is torn a little bit, but I'm really, really excited for you and, and so grateful for all that you've done to help this project grow and thrive. So thank you so much, John. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. I um, would never have thought that it would be something that I enjoy, but it has been one of one of my favorite projects that I've ever worked on in any work capacity. I've I've loved it, and I am also very heart torn to be leaving the Tuesday tips if they're kind of my baby, <laughs> and I, and I'm leaving yes. them, and, and I don't know. I've enjoyed being able to spend time with work with you, Marissa, and to all of our listeners out there, um, give you little tidbits of, of things that I think would help you. And, and it's been a pleasure and a joy. And thank you. Thank you so much. As we come to the end of season two of the USU Career Studio podcast, we want to say a huge thank you to all of our subscribers and listeners throughout the world. Since our launch in July of 2020, we have had well over 2,300 listens and gained worldwide listeners in 15 countries. I also want to say a huge thank you to our wonderful guests for sharing their time and their wisdom with us here. Additionally, I want to give a huge shout out to our amazing editor, Lindsay Smith, our YouTube closed captioning expert, Kate Orton, our social media guru, Megan Brown, and our fabulous and sadly retired Tuesday tip host, John Folger, for making this project happen. The USU Career Studio podcast will be taking a short break from June to August of 2021 and will resume episodes releasing starting September of 2021 with some new surprises and twists in store. In the meantime, make sure to check out previous episodes you've missed and revisit some of your favorites. If you haven't already, please subscribe and rate our podcast wherever you listen. We'd love to hear your feedback and any ways we can make it even better. We'll see you in September 2021. Go Aggies!